when we had to kneel down on our knees with our feet tucked underneath of us in kind of a prayer type of position with our, with our hands across our uh, laps folded. We had to sit there for hours this way on a cement floor. At first we got to use blankets and in the later years we didn't even get to use blankets. But there was this one old man who got to sit in a chair in the back of the room and on that morning he was gasping for breath for about the length of the meeting. It was like two and a half to three hours, something like that. And Rama was talking to him during the meeting a couple of times and said to him, Brother, it's better for you to, to die among the brethren than to go to the hospital. And you have a, you know, it's more peaceful here. Than you, can't, you don't want to go among the doctors or the, the, the heathens because of the evil things that they will do to you and stuff. This man was sitting in the back of the room, gasping for air, couldn't breathe. He was grabbing the arms of the chair and just shaking. This went on to that till the meeting was over, and then Rama told some of the older brethren to take this man over to one of the neighbor houses, which um, belonged to um, members of the group also. They they had no more than got got him over there, and he died. And Rama sent one of the men over there to make sure that he was dead. And so this man went over there, took a flashlight, shined it in this dead person's eyes. They didn't respond, and so he came running back, told Rama that the man was definitely dead. Rama said, all right, now call the ambulance. And the only thing that we can figure out is that Rama wanted to make sure this man was dead, that if they went to the hospital with him, that there was no way they were going to revive him again. So that was one case. There was another man's wife who had lupus and, had, and was on kidney, kidney dialysis two, three times a week. At some point, Rama told her to come over to the, to the place there by Shano and stay for a few days. She was not allowed to get her kidney dialysis during that time. She became very sick and there was this little closet space underneath the stairs that came down to the basement where Rama told her to stay under there. There was a carpet under there and she was just supposed to sit under there, pray and sing songs of the Lord. This, she was under there for the whole weekend while we came for the meetings and we could hear her crying and moaning in pain under there. And she would cry out you know, at all hours of the day begging Rama to pray for her to take away the pain and, and to, to heal her. Rama just ignored her and left her go for the whole weekend. <laughs> so we had to sit there and listen to this whole thing go on and just bury our feelings. You know, we, we were scared of, for her life and wondering what was going on, but there was nothing we could do. We couldn't say anything. We couldn't express our feelings. and We, couldn't, we, couldn't, we were scared to make any moves against Rama or to try to do anything ourselves. So we had to just sit there and like, outwardly ignore what was happening. At the, a matter of a few weeks later, I don't know the exact details, but it was a matter of a few weeks later or a few days later, this woman died. And again, you know, the, the cause of the death was Rama's neglect, uh, not allowing her to get proper medical care. There was a young baby that died. It was during the week. This baby had developed pneumonia. The, the family lived near La Crosse, Wisconsin on a farm. And I heard this story from a young man who was, who was living with this family. The baby had gotten pneumonia and was very sick. And the family, the husband and wife were calling Rama up, begging Rama to pray for this baby. He would not pray for the baby. And then he would call back sometime later and they asked Rama if they could please take the baby to the hospital. And he had just, Rama had just got done yelling at the, the wives for putting their trust in doctors and th even thinking about going to doctors or to the hospital. So he definitely did not want them to go to the hospital. So this went on for hours and hours. And they kept calling Rama to pray or to let him go to the hospital. They kept asking over and over again. Finally, the baby's eyes rolled back and it was dead. This young man that was living there tried to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on the baby. And every time he would breathe into this baby's mouth, foam and just mucus would come up out of the baby's lungs. And the baby was dead. There was no bringing it back. The, the mother went hysterical. The father got on the phone to Rama and told what was going on. And then Rama told the, the father to give the phone to this young man. Rama told this young man to take the baby up to a hillside in the, north, in the far part of the farm and bury this baby. To this day, that baby is buried up there. This, this, there has been no investigation. I do not know the proper death certificate or, or what has happened on this thing. But this all needs to be investigated. It was all, all covered up. That was one baby that died. There was another baby who the, the father and mother were in a car accident. This baby was thrown around in the car. It had hit his head, never went to the hospital or got a, uh, checked up. 
A few weeks later, this baby went into convulsion. For 24 hours, this baby, baby was in convulsions, and Rama would not let them take it to the hospital. It laid there on a the floor, shaking him and uh, you know, contorting at Rama's compound. This baby eventually died with no medical help also. There was um, another mother whose baby um, went into some kind of convulsions. It was a very young baby. I don't know the exact details on that. She went rushing to the emergency room with that baby. <laughs> By the time she got there, that baby had died too. There were several miscarriages, all kind of at the same period of time. Almost every mother in the group had a miscarriage. You know, it was because these people were the mothers were fasting while they were pregnant. They were under, we were all under a very huge amount of stress. Rama was yelling at us for not following, not obeying his rules, and and there was this huge emotional just stress that we lived under 24 hours a day for years and it, it just gnawed away to, at us. I weighed 155 pounds when I got into the group. I weigh 150 pounds now. I was down to 120 pounds while I was in the group. And it was, there. we ate one meal a day for four days a week, three days a week we fasted. So that's all the food that I got. And yet I was working 17 to 20 hours a day getting three to four hours of sleep a night at best. Some nights I didn't sleep at all. I went straight through to the next day. Building furniture, having to drive with no sleep. I, I've been in so many close calls in, car, in near car accidents that I should have been dead several times over. And it's only some kind of inner, inner guide, angel, or whatever you want to call it, that has kept me alive. I've, so many times something has woken me up at the last second before I would have hit a car or a mailbox or gone off a cliff or different things, but I'm still alive. And you know, I really believe that you know, something has kept me going for a reason. Um, one particular incident, we did a lot of construction at this compound. We literally took a small acreage that had a, a house and a little tiny shed on it and transformed that property into a totally different landscape by hauling dirt around in wheelbarrows um, and with shovels and wheelbarrows. Um, we changed the shape of the house, added on a whole um, prayer room building, a library room, a great big steel structure that turned into a, a massive compound, much bigger than what Waco was, all built out of I-beams and steel. We, you know, we had to uh, drill holes, put this thing together with bolts. There was a lot of welding. There was a, uh, air, all the roof was all quarter inch. Uh, steel deck plate. There was a lot of heavy lifting that went on. Very dangerous work. We had no proper um, safety equipment, safety glasses. There was no scaffold, proper scaffolding or uh, harnesses to protect us from falls or anything. We were never paid a penny for all the work we did for all the years we were in there. The, the money that we got from our outside jobs during the week most of it, a good portion of it, went right into the construction projects or right into a tenth part came right off the top of our income for for the tithing that we had to give and then the money we were we were generously supposed to give to these building projects so money and and materials and equipment and tools and everything was invested into these uh, building projects and stuff the recklessness that Rama as a construction leader um, made us work under is incredible there were people who nearly got killed on the job working at these different construction projects and I will tell you one particular instance that was just phenomenal. There was about a, a section of this uh, roof that had quarter-inch steel deck plate on it with I-beams underneath uh, as the main structure and then uh, six-inch channel irons as kind of the rib work underneath. So we're talking about tons and tons of steel work. And this deck was, I don't remember the exact size, at least 20 feet by 20 feet. And he wanted to move, he had removed this roof section from this building and wanted to move it out of the way. We had to walk approximately 300 yards with this um, big deck section to another part of the yard. <laughs> so we had all of the people gather around this deck plate and all of the little children, all the way down to little tiny children. And they were all supposed to, you know, count to three and heave and lift up this deck section. And they would carry it, you know, by leg power forward a few feet, and then they would set it down on these steel sawhorses. And so a little, few, few feet at a time, they moved this thing, this 300 yards to this other location. Well, somewhere midway through this thing, 
they had, they had said one, two, three, heave, and they'd all lifted it up, moved it ahead, and set it down. And as, when they set it down, there was this big sigh of relief, and everything was quiet for a split second until they were ready to go again. Well, in that split second, all of a sudden, sudden this piercing scream went through the air, and somebody screamed out, Enoch's head is under there. And so everybody heaved up again and lifted this deck plate up. And here this little child who was probably, I don't know exact age, probably seven, eight years old, something like that, had gotten his head between the steel sawhorse and his deck and the I-beam the underneath had come down and started crushing his head between the steel I-beam and the steel sawhorse. And as he screamed out, you know, the, it was only a miracle that his skull didn't get crushed under there. But they lifted the deck off, they grabbed him out from underneath, hauled him up to the, toward the, the compound building. Rama was running up there with these other people. Again, no medicine, no hospital, no thought of even going to doctors or anything. He grabbed some olive oil, which was our only medicine, a bottle of olive anointing oil, as they say in the Bible. Put olive oil on this child's head, rubbed it, prayed for it, and that baby was left to get well on its own. Luckily, nothing happened to that baby, but it, it is a strange thing. This baby's name, or this little boy's name was Enoch. If you know the story in the Bible that Enoch lived only to a very young age in the book of Genesis and then walked with God, this is, is just brings shivers to even remember that story. In another incident, there was a heavy highline utility pole, um, you know, approximately 30 feet long, the kind that holds up the, the, the electricity wires. And they, <laughs> Rama wanted to move this pole again from up by the compound building down to this other storage building, again a, a distance of about two to three hundred yards. Rama had all the small children line up along the length of this pole and start rolling it. And then Rama was walking along the side. I was actually rock walking with Rama at that time and a couple other people. He was giggling and laughing watching, watching all these children roll this pole. I was like horrified because I could see what was happening. These children were rolling this pole and it was gaining momentum. And I felt like the intuition was inside of me that something's going to happen bad here. And at that very moment, this little girl was pushing ahead and she rolled too far. Her hands went over the top of the pole and she fell on her belly on the pole. And her, she was small, only like five years old, six years old. And her arms went around the far side of the pole and got drug underneath like a rolling pin. And the pole, went, rolled, like she was stuck then, and the pole rolled right over the top of her. I mean, literally rolled right over her head, her whole body and everything, and went on over the top of her out the other side. And, and I let out a gasp and went running over there. Rama was still laughing. He hadn't even seen what had happened. And when I took off running, then he followed over there, and picked a girl up. Some other people came running over there, picked a girl up. She was crying that her arm had been hurt. And so Rama had one of the other men hold her arm up in the air and told her to stop crying and told her told this man to take this little girl up to her mother and have her mother take care of her. He never prayed for her, nothing. And it, you know, there was, no again, no doctor, no hospital, no medical attention. <coughs> this girl now is like 20 years old. She still, to this day, has trouble with that arm. There has never been any, no charges were brought. Nothing was ever done. This girl never got a medical attention for that arm. And then these are the kind of things that went on. There was another incident where a man... We had to dig tunnels under Rama's house to um, el eliminate the water problem. There was water that would get into his basement when it would rain hard. He had to brainstorm, supposedly word of God, that if he would dig tunnels under his house and fill the, these tunnels up with rock, this was underneath of his basement floor, you have to understand, that, that the, the rainwater would run through these tunnels out to the other side of his house and the water wouldn't go into his house. And so for weeks... I and several other members in the group had to dig through these little tunnels that were approximately two foot by two foot all the way under his basement floor to the other far side of his house and then we had to dig up or somebody would dig down to meet our tunnel from the other side. Well in the process of digging down from the ground level down to the along the basement wall down to meet our tunnel this one man was down in, the, in this hole in the ground and the walls of this uh, hole caved in on him and buried him in sand up to his neck. And they, they did, they called an ambulance in there because they were scared this, he was going to die before they got him out of there. <clears throat> and they, they uh, put an oxygen mask on him, and then the brethren dug out the sand around him and got him free. Well, he was never taken to the hospital or anything. 
um, to be checked up. They, the ambulance left right after the words and the Rama told them that we were going to take care of it. There was nothing wrong. So again, a, a very close call where this man should have died, could have died easily. Um, there were incidents like this that happened time after time. I watched another man get his fingers sawed off in a, in a, in a circular saw doing carpentry work. Um, there were people who got like feet and hands cut and gashed open or feet smashed, you know, with all these I-beams and, and deck plates and things that we worked at. Um, welding flash, people working around welders and stuff that, that saw the welding flash that weren't supposed to. You know, these things were continuous things that went on. Um, this was just a matter of just matter of course during the time that we were doing the construction. He had no regard for people's lives while we worked and stuff. The man was sadistic in the middle of all this heavy, heavy labor that was going on. He would stop all of a sudden and start playing a game with the children from the from the high deck that we were building. He'd make the boys and then the girls jump off this high deck down to the ground. Some of them hurt their ankles or hurt their backs. He would tell them to step aside, you know, and get out of the game. And then he kept on with the other children keep on playing. The ones that hurt themselves, they were like, you know, scolded because they didn't they didn't do it right.